Oh, magnify the Lord. Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together, Psalm 34. Amen. God is good. And we have lots of reasons to magnify him today. Amen. <clears throat> that we are to be imitators of Jesus Christ is not a debate in scripture. It is abundantly clear. Romans chapter 8, 29 says, for whom God foreknew, he also predestined. There's that word that we stumble over but notice what he predestined. He predestined to be conformed. He predestined that we, those whom, he, those whom he foreknew, which is us, he predestined that we would be conformed to the very image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. John says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, he who says he abides in him, Christians who say they abide in Jesus ought himself to walk even as Jesus walked. It isn't that we don't know that we're supposed to imitate Christ. It is that so often we don't do a very good job of it. So the goal of this message is to try to put it down on the lower shelf, to put a handle on the whole concept of imitating Christ, and then to invite you to imitate Christ in a specific area of his ministry, his life. Thank you for joining me on this brief journey into the scriptures. Max Lucado, that popular Christian author, in a book called God Came Near, a book that I have read and reread and all the pages are dog-eared and, and it's just falling apart. But that little book, God Came Near, in there, Lucado says this about imitating Christ. He says, Christianity in its purest form is nothing more than seeing Jesus. That's all. To be a Christian is to see Jesus. Christian service, he goes on to say, <clears throat> in its purest form, is nothing more than looking at Jesus and imitating what you see. That's Christian service. Does that sound simple enough? John Stott, another famous popular author, favorite of mine, perhaps yours too, John Stott, in a little book called Basic Christianity, a book that I highly recommend, every Christian should read John Stott's Basic Christianity. John Stott says, nobody who ever met Jesus ever had a moderate reaction to him. In other words, nobody ever just liked Jesus. He says in his book, he says that there were three basic reactions to Jesus. If you, if you survey his ministry, there were three basic reactions to him. Number one, there are those who hated him and wanted to kill him. You know who those people were. Number two, there were those who were afraid of him and ran away from him. And he doesn't say who these are. I, I think of demons who were afraid of Jesus, but perhaps he meant some other category that I'm not thinking of. And then thirdly, Stott says there were those who revered him and wanted to give their whole lives to him. It is in this idea of those who wanted to give their whole lives to Jesus that we get the word discipleship. And it is in relation to the word discipleship and disciple that we get the word rabbi. And Jesus was a rabbi. 
And in the Hebrew scriptures, in the Hebrew world, the rabbi was a very central figure, a very important person. But here is what we often don't think about. Let's think about a rabbi for a moment. The picture of a rabbi is a picture of a guy flanked by his disciples, a crowd of guys around him. And he's walking very briskly down the road, and they're walking behind him, and they're trying to keep up with him. And whatever he does, they do. In fact, there's a, a wonderful story of the disciples of this rabbi. And, and by the way, the way you become a disciple of a rabbi is that as you turn 12, 13 years old, you pick your rabbi, or the rabbi picks you, and better if he picks you. Rabbi will say, I want to disciple you. I admire you. Come follow me. That's what Jesus was doing when he called his disciples to come follow him. And in this particular story, the guys were following the rabbi so carefully. It says that when he spit, they measured how far he spit so they could spit that far. I mean, they, they, were, they were really into imitating the rabbi where he went. They went, they left home to follow him, to live with him, to go where he went, to do what he did, to live where he lived. And their goal was one, and that was to imitate the rabbi in every single thing that he did. And when the young men were leaving home to go follow the rabbi, the tradition was the parents would stand by the gate as they walked down the road, and the parents' final word to the young man would be, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. In other words, the student, the disciple followed him so closely that the dust from the road that came up from his feet, from his sandals, would cover them. That's how closely they were going to fo follow the rabbi. And that's why we have in Luke chapter 6 and verse 40, Luke 6 and verse 40, Jesus is speaking, Luke 6, 40. And Jesus says, the student is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will become like who? Become just like his teacher. The word student in that verse, Luke 640, is a word translated in different ways in different places. Here it says student because this is in the NIV. But in the older translator translations, it says when the disciple is fully trained, he'll become just like his teacher. And the word disciple it comes from the Greek word methetes, methetes. And the word methetes means student, pupil. It means learner. It means to be an apprentice, to sign up with a guy where you're going to go in his workshop and learn his trade by watching him, by imitating him, by following what he does. That's what the word disciple actually means. And in Jesus' day, the goal, the goal of the student, the goal of the apprentice, the goal of the learner, the goal of the student was to become happy and whole disciples of Jesus Christ. But that's not just a goal that was a goal back when Jesus was walking around on earth. That's still a goal in the 21st century today. That you and I would become happy and whole students of Jesus Christ. Happy, that's a, a word we need to be careful of, but, but happy, delighted, and whole. Whole meaning put together followers of Jesus Christ. That's that's the goal of discipleship. The problem, however, one of the problems is that Jesus did so many things that we can't do that we shouldn't even be attempting to do. 
Because so many of the things that Jesus did that people want to do today are things that pertain to his divine nature. He worked miracles. He walked on water. Don't try that. That's not for us. But remember that Jesus had both a divine side and a human side. His divinity, his humanity. And while we can't, we're not supposed to imitate his divinity, we can imitate his humanity. His humanity. And it is there on the human side of who Jesus was that there are so many things that he did that you and I should attempt at least to imitate. And the one thing that I'm calling you today to consider imitating Christ is to imitate Jesus in his compassion, his compassion. This came to mind as I watched the situation with the hurricane this week. And the word compassion loomed large on my radar. And I want you to listen to this scripture verse. It's the passage that Marjolene just read a few moments ago. Mark chapter 6, verse 34. Mark 6, 34 says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd, and so he began to teach them many things. Now, we don't have time to look at this passage in its entirety today, but just briefly, let me, let me orient you to the story. Um, look, if you will, at verses 30, 31, 32, 33 in that section. This sets up the story. Mark sets up the story. Basically, it's a busy day for Jesus and his disciples. The disciples are ministering all day long. They come back and they report to Jesus Christ that, you know, all the things that they had done. And Jesus said to them, hey, tell you what, let's get into a boat and go over to the other side and get away from the crowd so we can rest. Rest and ministry are very, very closely related. But it says the people saw them go and figured out where they were going and tracked them down. And by the time they got to where they were going, the people were already there waiting for them. Now, you would think that just this would give Jesus, you know, he would be a little bit miffed by that and say, why can't you guys behave? Go away. But no. It says when Jesus saw them, he had what? compassion on them because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd and he began to minister to them isn't that isn't that so like jesus ever want to get away from the crowd because you've had too much i have and jesus got away from the crowd a time or two but here in the story the lesson is it didn't, it didn't turn him off. He began to minister to them. Notice in verse 34, well, well, um, verse 35, it says, and when the day had been far spent, at the end of the day, this is sundown, it's been a long day, been a very busy day. At the end of the day, the disciples said to Jesus, Jesus, look, the people aren't leaving. This is a desolate place. There are no shops here. This is out in the wilderness. I tell you, you ought to send them away so they can go to the nearby towns and buy dinner. This is a desolate place. You know, I, I Googled desolate places yesterday. And it brought up all kinds of places. It talked about the drought putting millions at risk in the Horn of Africa. I saw one website where it says in broad letters, if rain doesn't come now, too many will die. In East Africa, the suffering here is unequal, I saw on a BBC World News report. 
But alas, we don't have to go to Africa. We can go to Florida. We can go where our Hurricane Ian just caused devastation. And those people will tell you this is a desolate place where they are. I heard a young girl yesterday morning on a newscast. She and her husband were married not long ago, and she said, my, my poor husband spent the last year and a half building this business, and now she said, it's gone, and she just sobbed, and she just sobbed, and she just sobbed. And as I said earlier, I heard numerous people saying, my house used to be there. My car is gone. Everything is gone. All my pictures, all my, it's all gone. There's a, a, a husband they pulled out from the rubble, but the wife can't be found. A desolate place in Puerto Rico right now, in the Dominican Republic, desolate places, a lot of them around the world. Verse 35, the disciples said, send the people away that they may get food to eat. And Jesus said, no, you give them something to eat. And they thought to themselves, this guy is crazy. This is a desolate place. There's nothing out here to eat. No water, no food. They said to Jesus, Jesus, do you, if we had 200 denarii, that's a lot of money. You think if we had 200 denarii and the possibility to go buy food, that we could feed all these people? And Mark says there were 5,000 people there. And back in those days, they only counted the men. So add a woman and at least two children, and that is very conservative because in that culture, they, may, they could have had 10 kids. But let's just say a husband and a wife and two children, you multiply five by four, and that is 20,000 people. And Jesus looks at his 12 disciples and says, you give them something to eat. When they stood there in astonishment, Jesus asked them the question. This is, this is the pivot question. This is, this is the crucial question. This is the question that Jesus asked his disciples. It's the question for you, for you, for me, for all of us. Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? How much food do you have? What do you, what do you got? And they had no clue. And suddenly Philip, in another gospel, I think it's Philip who knew, happened to know that there was one little guy, one lad, a young boy, who showed up, he came with the crowd, and he happened to bring lunch. He had a lunch box. And as you've heard me say before, blessed be his mother who told him, son, if you're gonna follow Jesus all day, you better take your lunch. Gotta be a mama there. And Philip happened to know that, and Philip spoke up and said, hey, by the way, well, the only food we have in the crowd is there's a little guy over here that has a lunch box, and whatever he has in the lunch box, if we go after him, he's gonna take off running because he knows. But you know, the young guy didn't take off running at all. Isn't it wonderful? He surrendered his lunchbox and they counted and they had two small fish and they had five loaves. And the disciples said, Jesus, you know, this is not gonna work. And Jesus said, Set the people down in companies, in different groups of 50, in different, different small groups. And you know the story, Jesus took the bread, he held it up, and the fish, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and they began to pass it out. And the more they passed it out, the more it multiplied before their eyes. And they're flabbergasted. They can't figure this out. And it just keeps happening. And it keeps happening. And all the people, 20,000 people, they all eat, ate. And they were full. And there were 12 baskets full left over. One basket for each disciple to take home. 
as a reminder of the faithfulness of God and the power of Jesus Christ. And that's where the story ends in the Gospel of Mark. The question is, what is the overarching point of the story? And the overarching point of the story is the compassion of Jesus and his power. Jesus was moved with compassion. And it says, Mark says, the reason he was moved is because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. The question is, what's the problem with sheep having no shepherd? And the answer is that sheep without shepherd are vulnerable. Vulnerable. And talk about vulnerable people in our world. Talk about vulnerable people in our world who are dealing with trauma and PTSD and people who have been abused sexually and physically and violently and all kinds of situations that people deal with in our world. Vulnerable people and Jesus sees them and he wants us to see them. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And because of the way he saw them, his heart was moved with compassion. And the word compassion is a combination of two words in the Latin, okay? Actually in the English, it's come passion. In the Latin, it's come passio. And in those, in that formation, come, is with and passio is to suffer. So compassion is to suffer with. Compassion is to enter into the suffering of the person for whom you have this uh, compassion to suffer with. So let me quickly hold up a couple of principles here in the story that I think are helpful, can be helpful for us as we seek to imitate Christ. Number one, a token reaction to the world's plight isn't enough. A token reaction to the plight of the world isn't enough. Ministry is all about people. We must respond in tangible ways to the needs of the poor and the oppressed. Mahatma Gandhi is the guy who said, there are people in this world so hungry for, for bread that God cannot reveal himself. There are people in this world so hungry that God cannot reveal himself to them apart from bread, physical bread. They need bread. A token reaction to the plight of the world is not enough, as we see in the story. You need to give him something to eat. Don't just say, bless you. We've had a good day. Go on home. Hallelujah. No, no, no. You sit him down and give him something to eat. A token response is not enough. Secondly, number two, as imitators of Christ, we must become an active part of meeting the needs of hungry, vulnerable people. As imitators of Christ, we must become active parts, tangible active parts of meeting the needs of hungry and vulnerable people. You know why? Because if we're imitating Christ, we have to do that because that's what Christ did. Jesus wants us to be an active part of meeting those needs. And the good news is that the resources needed to meet those needs are amply supplied when we look to Jesus Christ. Number three, imitation involves not only copying external behavior, but also replicating internal motivation. I wish I had these up on the screen for you because these are long sentences. Let me read it again. Imitation, imitating Christ, involves not only copying external behavior, but also replicating internal motivation. 
I'm borrowing that statement from Our Daily Bread, an article that I read, Our Daily Bread, that little devotional magazine. And some years ago, a writer by the name of Robert Solomon did that devotional, and, and he made that statement, and I'm, I'm giving credit to him. He goes on to say that the motivation behind our action will determine whether we are truly imitating Jesus or simply mimicking him. A lot of people mimic Jesus, but not everyone imitate him. There's a difference between imitating and mimicking. You can, you can mimic, you can, you can do all the, you know, the routine mimicking, but imitating Christ goes beyond external, external behavior. What Jesus did, observing that externally, it goes to an internal motivation. What motivates you? What motivated Jesus? Love. His love. His love for the people. Jesus was motivated by love and compassion. He wanted to enter into their suffering. He wanted to be with them. This is called the ministry of presence. I just finished a mental health course that I completed last week. And in the final modules, they were talking about the ministry of presence. And nobody did this better than Jesus. Just to be there, just to be with them. You don't have to say anything. Don't do anything. Just be there. Be there. The ministry, the presence. Jesus wanted to enter into their world. And this week I'm encouraging you to memorize Mark 6:34, the verse that I opened with. Memorize the verse, repeat the verse, Mark 6:34. Pray for a heart like Jesus, moved by the plight of desolate, vulnerable, and hungry people around you. They're all around you. They're in Charlotte. They're in the UK. They're in wherever you are. They're there. Pray for God to open your heart to them, to their plight. And watch for and act upon any opportunity to be an active part of meeting their needs. I want to be very practical today about that. You see, in feeding the multitudes, Jesus wanted to show himself to not just be physical bread because you're hungry. He wanted to show himself. He wanted the disciples to understand that he is actually the bread of life. In John chapter 6, verse 48, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. If you're hungry, come eat of me, because I am the bread of life. In telling the disciples to give the people something to eat, Jesus was inviting them to imitate him by becoming bread to the world, bread to the masses, bread to those hungry people. And some of you will recall that a number of months ago, I was in this pulpit preaching a sermon called Becoming Bread for the World when my, my, my body kind of gave out and I had to quit. And I was in the middle of telling you what Dr. Henry Nallen that wonderful writer and theologian who passed away now many years ago, he has a little book called Becoming the Beloved. How do we come the beloved? In the Bible, in the Bible, the Apostle Paul in particular, when he's writing to Philemon, he, he speaks of Philemon, he, he commends um, the disciple to Philemon as being accepted in the beloved. And Henry Nouwen says there's a way to become the beloved. Become the beloved disciple, to become the beloved follower of Christ. And the way we do that, he says, is to be the bread in the hands of Jesus. 
And if you're going to be the bread in the hands of Jesus in a world that is as broken as our world is, he says you have to be, number one, what? Taken. Number two, you have to be blessed. Blessed by God. Number three, you have to be broken. And number four, and finally, you have to be what? Given away. You got to give yourself away. Give yourself away to the poor and to the vulnerable and to the broken. Henry Nowen says that the first step toward healing and wholeness is to recognize our own brokenness. Because we will only respond to the brokenness of the people in the world when we understand our own brokenness. There is a real sense in which a lot of us are simply broken people trying to fix one another. Now and says our greatest fulfillment in this life comes through giving ourselves away, giving ourselves away. That's what Mother Teresa did. Mother Teresa came from a fairly wealthy family in Macedonia over in Eastern Europe. She vowed from a little girl that she wanted to serve the Lord and give herself to the poorest of the poor. She read the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, and she picked mercy. She says, I want to be a person of mercy. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall, what? Obtain mercy. And Mother Teresa surely obtained mercy as she gave herself away in the slums of Calcutta, India. And somebody said that the reason the world so admired and continues to admire Mother Teresa till this day is because deep in our hearts, we all know that what she did, we can do too, but we don't do it. We don't do it. We don't do it. What did Mother Teresa did? In her own words, as she would tell people who came from all around the globe to see her at the Mothers of Charity facility there in Calcutta, Mother Teresa said, simply do something beautiful for Jesus, that's all. Just do something beautiful for Jesus. Just be Jesus to the poor. Just be Jesus to the vulnerable. Just be Jesus to the people, just the ones closest to you. Respond. Imitate Jesus in being Jesus to them. And the story is told that this little boy was blind. And he'd become accustomed to sitting by the side of the road and begging. He had a little cup. And he was hoping that people would look upon his plight and put some coin in the cup as they pass by. And he did that every day. That's how he survived. And this one day, he heard a commotion. And it got louder and louder. And the crowd was coming. And he had no idea if he was in the path of the people. And maybe he might get stampeded. Who knows? And, and as the crowd grew closer, he felt the body of some big person who just kind of hovered over him. And he could tell that this person was protecting him and hovering over him, and he could hear and feel the people running and the noise, and, and then he heard it pass where he was, and he heard as it went into the distance, and he knew it was dying out. They, they were gone, and then this person hovering over him slowly began to lift up and pull away without saying a word, and the young guy had no idea who this person was. But he reached out, his eyes were blind. He reached out and he said, sir, sir, are you Jesus? Are you Jesus? He'd read the stories, he'd heard. Maybe his mom read the Bible stories to him if he couldn't see. And he heard about Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus. 
the story right on my heart every word the stories of Jesus of how he loved people how he touched people how he was present with people how he loved people unconditionally and he was so moved by whoever this person was and he could only think hey sir are you Jesus are you Jesus As believers seeking to imitate Jesus, there are only a couple of questions we have to answer. How much food do you have? What do you have? And like the disciples, most of us will say, it's not even a wise question, I have nothing. And like the disciples, we need to discover how much we have. Because you see, little is much when God is in it. An ordinary little boy at that crowd that day with a small lunch pail, ordinary people. You know the song, God uses ordinary people. He uses people who are willing to do what he commands. God uses people just like you and me who are willing to do what he commands. Are you willing to do what Jesus says? Just like the little lad who gave Jesus all he had and the multitudes were fed with the fish and the loaves of bread and what you have may not seem much, but when you yield it to the touch of the master's loving hand, then you will understand that your life will never be the same. So the first question is, how much do you have? And the second question is, who will be Jesus? Who will be Jesus to someone today? Who will give himself, give herself away to be Jesus to somebody? who is hanging on a thread. And the only hope, the only hope there is, is for you to be Jesus to them. That's the question. And that's why we imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.